All right, so after the call is over in the next day or so, as soon as I receive the court recording, I will be forwarding it um, to all participants. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, presenter tonight. You all know Earl Morris. Um, he has coached um, Rachel Holman's team, Jennifer Jones, and Pat Simmons. In, um, from 2009 to 2015, he coached those three teams to three Canadian championships plus three runner, uh, runners-up positions. So a very, very successful coach. He is one of four athletes to actually compete at the Briar representing three different provinces. So that's what military service does for you. Uh -huh. Military brats, successful military brats like Earl Morris. <laughs> Earl also runs uh, coaching workshops all over Canada, um, coaching weekends that coaches attend and uh, Earl imparts his tremendous depth of wisdom. Um, and he's also now moving into the States to do workshops in the States. So don't share everything with them, Earl. Save <laughs> right. some Canadian coaches. So without right. um, me blathering on anymore, welcome, Earl, and thank you so much for um, agreeing to do the webinar with us. Take it away. Great stuff. Well, thanks so much, Andrea. Really, uh, really happy to be here. Really happy to... Uh, share my knowledge with uh, other folks uh, that are listening in tonight and um, a really good topic. I think uh, our uh, athletes are your athletes coachable. And I think that um, if the majority of people are junior coaches out there or U18 or U15 or whatever, I think they'll find this is going to work out very well for them. Um, so I just want to make sure my PowerPoint will start and uh, it looks like uh, I've got my first page up there, but other than that, uh, it's not uh, uh, headed on to uh, step number two here. So uh, technology um, sometimes lets us down or lets me down. I don't know if you can help me with that, Andrea, at all or not. Um, try closing it and opening it again, Earl. Right. Okay, it looks like um, looks like we're we're good. Okay, yeah. So um, I don't know if anybody is here from Saskatchewan, but I always like to tell people, even though I was a military brat, I did get started in curling. Uh, I grew up in Saskatchewan, and it seems like pretty much either a hockey player or a curler in the winter time. And I wasn't very big, so I ended up becoming a curler, and uh, it was just uh, a wonderful time. That's for sure. Um, Frozen again? Yeah. Yeah. Here, I'll just try another way of getting to the next page. Okay, I've got a, I think this will work. We'll just uh, hang in there with us, folks. I'm sure we'll get her going. And at uh, any rate, uh, bottle of seven up. You don't see them around very much anymore. And that's basically how I got hooked on curling because. Um, my grade seven teacher held a bond spiel and I won a bottle of seven up and it's just like those little rock bond spiels where you, you, you take kids out, they play four ends, they have lunch, they play four more ends, they get a prize and, and we hook a lot of them that way as well. So I think it's fair to say that I am a lifer and, um, you know, have loved the game ever since I got started and love it as much today as, uh, as I did back then. In fact, I went back to my hometown recently and uh, did a fundraiser and a little uh, camp for a day. And uh, they actually had a grade seven picture uh, of me, uh, not of me, but of our whole class. So I just thought I might share it with you. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not the guy in the back row on the right. I'm actually second from the left in the front row. Uh, but basically, yeah, that was uh, my uh, my hometown. Uh, I'm really proud of the fact that, yeah, I was one of four people that has ended up um, 
uh, going to the briar from three different provinces. But really, my love of curling started with my grandfather. And we're most proud of the fact that we're the only family uh, that has three different generations that have skipped in the briar. So that's pretty special because he's the guy that did get me involved right from the get go. And uh, I'm forever grateful to him for that. That's for sure, because it's led to so many uh, wonderful things. And so after my playing days, I became a coach and uh, probably got into it fairly early by competitive coaching standards. In other words, people who curl competitively might maybe get into coaching uh, way after they played for a long time. But I I quit playing relatively early, like in about my late 40s, and uh, and was quite anxious to uh, coach because I've always enjoyed it. And so uh, I've been doing that now that I see the number down there, Little Rock Team 1990, for about 25 years. Uh, so maybe that was my first team of, of significance or note, and that was John's Little Rock Team. And my apologies to those people who aren't, Toronto Maple Leaf fans, but uh, that's just the way it is. And there's a connection to the Holman team there, because if you're looking at that picture and you see the guy in the red hat on the right, that's actually Rachel's older brother, Rachel Holman's older brother, Mark. And that's how I got started. And of course, this even gets more bizarre sometimes when you look back at old pictures, because the guy in the red uh, shirt with RJ in the front is someone by the name of Sebastian Robillard. And his sister, Melanie, uh, has ended up winning a world uh, women's championship out of Germany. So, uh, boy, uh, once you've curled a little while, uh, it's amazing um, uh, the, the degrees of separation. And then the uh, fourth guy uh, is uh, another buddy of John's that played ball. But that was the uh, first Little Rock team way back when. So, um, and of course, boom. Uh, it's amazing how quickly you go from Little Rocks to uh, to something like the Olympics, and that's our family in 2010 in uh, in Vancouver. And we're very uh, uh, sharing a proud moment with John when he won his Olympic goals. Um, you probably recognize this little girl. Uh, you probably were watching her play so tremendously well on TV. Uh, if you weren't down to watch it live, maybe some of you, like Benoit, may have made it in there. I don't know, but uh, that's Rachel Holman uh, when I was coaching John and her brother and she came to our send-off party to uh, the Nationals and uh, she was a keener right from the time she was five years old and this uh, probably looks more like you might recognize her and uh, what an amazing week and what two worthy representatives we have going to uh, the Olympics. It's going to be very exciting because they're just such wonderful and and tough teams that's for sure uh andrea's mentioned the good fortune i've had uh coaching in recent times and uh did, did did get to work with some wonderful teams and i've pretty much uh retired from full-time coaching and that's basically where i'm at these days uh so uh happy to do that it was time to move on and uh and not be away as much and uh, so it's been uh, it's been very good. I've enjoyed the transition um, away from coaching full time because the other part of it is if you're coaching high performance, then you want to be best at it. You want to be world leading and you just can't sit on your hands. And so uh, maybe a message to all of you folks uh, that are coaching, uh, just a reminder that uh, it is a difference maker, uh, you know, the more time you put into it. So I encourage you all to give it the uh, the time it deserves so that you are able to maximize your skill and help out teams that you might be uh, working with. So are your athletes coachable? That's the uh, question that we're talking about here. And, uh, you know, a very good question. I mean, a very good question from a number of points of view. Uh, you know, uh, maybe they look in the mirror and ask themselves that, or maybe you as a coach say, man, all I really would like to have is coachable athletes. And, uh, and you know, that's just not the way it seems to work, that you end up with a perfect team of people that are everything you'd like them to be, that's for sure. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we'll answer that question. And, and one of the things that's interesting, I picked up this quote from Michael Jordan, and he says that his best skill that he was is that he was coachable. 
And I think one of the things about coachability is that it often, I think, uh, develops with age uh, and experience uh, and things like that. But, uh, you know, if I look at some other situations where I say, are your athletes coachable? Uh, I would certainly say that a common thread of anybody that was a Canadian junior champion over the past 20 years would be that, that they were coachable. Um, on the other hand, uh, we all can think of a number of people who maybe never lived up to the expectations that people had for them and that they had for themselves. And quite possibly, I would say it'd be fair to say that one of those reasons was because they were not coachable. But that word coachable can be used in many different ways. And there's a whole bunch of people that are responsible for the coachability of athletes. Uh, probably it starts when you're looking to junior level with their parents and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, their, uh, their coaches and also their teammates would all be on maybe the short list of people that might impact whether other people uh, are coachable. Okay, so um, bear with me. The PowerPoint is, is working pretty good, but um, it takes me two or three times, two or three different ways here, so it won't be as smooth as I might like it to be, but hopefully uh, bear with me and you'll still find it interesting enough. So, all right, so what about athletes who are not coachable? You know, um, how, do you, how do you identify them? Or what are signs that they might not be coachable? Well, uh, you people that don't always stay on a team for a, an extended period of time, uh, you know, and maybe are the kind of people who talk about making a commitment, but in fact, give, uh, you know, a minimum commitment to, the team kind of thing. Uh, maybe they're the kind of people that take critique too personally. So when you're trying as a coach to interact with them and help them out, um, they're immediately go on the defensive. And, uh, and so those are the kind of people that probably are maybe the same way with their teammates uh, and therefore are not going to find maybe uh, too many people to, to, to play with over time unless it's the same kind of people. And then uh, it's probably just as well that they're all in the same, uh, same team together. But uh, I feel badly for the coach who will have to, uh, to deal with that. That's for sure. Um, never their fault. You know, these are the kinds of things maybe that not coachable athletes uh, uh, are going to be talking about. There's always an excuse for it not going as well as it should have. And then the excuses might include that maybe it wasn't just uh, the right coach. So, you know, there's, um, there's some of the things that are ongoing here that, that might be uh, the reasons why you could say uh, that, they're like, that they're like that, that they're not coachable. Um, it certainly doesn't mean that coachable athletes will follow us aimlessly and do whatever it is that we uh, ask them to do. I think we have to earn that right from our athletes to have them follow what it is that we'd like them to do in what er whatever area of high performance that might be. I genuinely believe uh, that most athletes, just like coaches, are trying to be the best that they can be. Those that are involved certainly in high performance, who've made that extra commitment, who said, okay, this is gonna be how I spend uh, the majority of my winter uh, traveling or whatever the case might be so that you know, they're people that really want to be the best that we can be, that they can be, uh, just as we are hoping to do that as well. So if we look at maybe signs that an athlete is coachable, um, I think uh, I, I would happily say a good team player uh, who uh, is a good team player with that team and also gets along well with the coach. And, uh, and they embrace the commitment. They uh, they're really are going to uh, work hard when uh, they say they are. And at the same time, they're prepared to embrace critique as an opportunity to get better. And, uh, and also they take their share of responsibility when things are, are going poorly. And I think that that's such an important part of a high performance team, a very coachable high performance team, 
that, uh, that, you know, there's never silence after a miss. Somebody stands up or, or speaks up and says, oh, I could have swept that a little bit better or I could have thrown that a little bit better or uh, maybe it could have been called a little bit better. Usually, you know, something's got off the rails. Sometimes it might be two or three parts of that equation. But nevertheless, the successful teams are the ones that are prepared to not suffer in silence, but to be able to uh, say something uh, about that miss. And of course, the uh, the most important part is it allows everybody on the team, including the coach, to be able to move on to the next shot, which is really, you know, the most important thing. Because once you've missed it, nothing you can do about it. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Uh, so we can come back with an even better shot the next time around. Yeah, and no excuses. You know, um, certainly prepared after a game to say, you know what, I have to play better. And I really like that when I hear that in in a team. Um, you know, when you've got four athletes, and it's one of the downsides that I always felt about keeping percentages, and that is that sometimes then there might be people thinking that they don't share the responsibility for a loss. And, and quite frankly, uh, on any given day, uh, we all could have made a difference, whether we curled 90% or whether we curled 70%. And on the best teams, I think people are inward thinking and are prepared after a game when there's a loss to say, you know what, uh, I really should have made that hit in, in, in nine. That was really important. Sorry, uh, sorry team. And it might have been the only shot that person missed, but nevertheless, they're not making any excuses and they're, uh, they're taking their share of the responsibility. I mean, the bottom line is, I think nobody goes out there uh, when you're playing highly competitive curling uh, to not do anything better uh, than try and, 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 and play 100%. And, and so... You know, if they don't happen to have a good game, well, that's just uh, the way it is. If they're a really good competitive high-performance curler and doing all the things that uh, they should be doing to let them stay on top of their game, they're going to make up for it another time. And, of course, uh, it's an ongoing uh, striving to master the game of curling. Uh, again, whether you're a coach or whether you are uh, an athlete that's playing so when you look at those characteristics that we looked at for uh, for coachability, you know, the commitment and uh, basically embracing critique and so on, and then you look at what they say or what Olympic champions have said when they've been asked that same question, you get some characteristics in there that uh, are parallel uh, or maybe combined would end up giving us the perfect package, that's for sure. Dreaming big is always part of every Olympian because the Olympics are such a long way off. It's four years. Uh, you need to have that long dream um, so that uh, it can keep you motivated. They're very passionate and committed to their sport. They, they definitely are goal oriented and incredibly good at planning and they're learning machines and they just soak up as much information as they can get their hands on. And that's why I think sometimes we as coaches uh, make a mistake of not sharing the opportunity with others to work with our team. And later on, when we look at, uh, at different aspects of high performance, uh, I'll talk to you about the things that the Holman team does in terms of, uh, of learning and, and who it is that helps them out. But, you know, I don't think we should be afraid as coaches that if we, if we don't have an expertise in a certain area, that we shouldn't be afraid to call on others to, to help us out, sometimes as volunteers, because budgets are pretty slim, uh, or, uh, or certainly the odd time when we can afford to pay people, that's for sure. And of course, with Olympic athletes, they're always uh, you know really shooting for perfection, and it always makes me think of the expression, you know, perfection is the goal, but excellence will be tolerated. And I think that's so true and, uh, and very good is, as, is pretty good in there as well. And, uh, but at the same time, it's, I'm reminded that when we work with juniors that are not at the absolute elite levels, uh, we need to be wary of that and not expect perfection. Uh, 
be really happy if we get excellence every once in a while, but be pretty happy with very good. And uh, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more. And they're coachable. You know, they, they, uh, because these uh, Olympic athletes are passionate about their sport and their learning machines, they are coachable. So it's really important for us to do the best we can to give them what it is that you, they need. Well, um, so I've spent a lot of time working with Rachel and working with uh, John. Uh, and I'm, you know, asking myself the question, what were they like in juniors? Were they coachable? And, uh, and the answer is, and that's a picture, that's a rare picture. That's of them uh, in mixed doubles. And of course, they are no more as uh, the number one ranked team in mixed doubles in Canada because of Rachel's uh, <coughs> wonderful performance with her team, uh, with them heading off uh, representing Canada wi Canadian women at the, uh, at the Olympics. So uh, the way the rules work is you're allowed to uh, get a new partner. They... Uh, they, uh, and they, if you're if you're one of the teams that's already qualified. So in John's case, in case you hadn't heard, um, he has uh, asked Caitlin Laws, and she has said yes. Caitlin and uh, John have curled together before, uh, uh, two or three times in uh, the Continental Cup, and had great success. And uh, so, at any rate, hopefully they'll be able to get ramped up and get an opportunity uh, to represent our country in the Olympics. So, uh, what about Johnny? Was he coachable as a junior? Well, I can tell you uh, not right away. Uh, certainly as a young, uh, headstrong skip, uh, bad body language was the kind of thing that got in the way of maybe his teams playing in an inspired manner. And I can remember, you know, having a heart to heart with him one day saying, you know, Johnny, if you aren't, don't start being easier on your players, you're going to basically find you won't have a whole bunch of people to, to curl with anymore. So uh, he was able to take that to heart and, and change the way that he operated. Plus, he, uh, as many youngsters do, he felt that uh, there was one way to play strategy, certainly on the boys' side, and that was high-octane offense, 24-7. And uh, so I'm always happy when athletes – are interested in doing that because I think it's a lot easier to dial people back from you know wanting to play high octane all the time than to get them from being very conservative and moving to uh, to uh, you know picking their spots for uh, for uh, high octane uh, offensive curling and so on. Uh, Rachel, well, uh, she wasn't uh, coachable right away either one of her problems as a junior was having the ability to bounce back uh not necessarily after games but in the middle of a game if things went poorly uh she could go quiet for an extended period of time and uh and that maybe got in her way of inspiring the team for the rest of the end uh usually by the end of the end or a little while thereafter uh she uh she'd been able to get over that but it took longer than we would have liked, and it got in the way of her maybe calling the game the way uh, she meant to. But uh, that's certainly all behind her now. She called an absolutely brilliant uh, set of games during the Olympic trials, and the final was no exception. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, strategy, as I say, was part of that. She was like John, uh, just high-octane offense all the time. And, uh, and then uh, it was a case of, well, over time, uh, getting her to try and, and cut that back. So before I go any further, I just want to say to all of you, uh, you know, thanks uh, for the job that you do, because we really need uh, lots of coaches in our sport. And if there's non-coaches here or there's athletes here, I apologize for lumping you all into one category. But nevertheless, if there's some parents here as well, it's all good. Uh, all of this stuff pretty much uh, applies, but I just do want to say that it, to me, as far as I'm concerned, is a uh, is a real challenge uh, to be a, a good high performance coach. And I thank you for taking on the responsibility and congratulate you on what you've done so far. And I wish you good luck the rest of the way. Uh, we did talk about, or I did look uh, 
at the uh, the OCC webinar advertisement, and these were some of the things that were talked about uh, that that maybe I would offer advice on, and I will. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to come out in different parts of my presentation, but I return to this slide at the end in case I haven't answered all of these, in which case I'll answer them then at that particular time, if that's uh, okay with everybody. So, you've, uh, you've taken on this responsibility uh, to be a high-performance coach, and, uh, you know, there is, uh, it's a big challenge here. Um, and, and, you know, it's a big challenge for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which, you know, you're dealing with, with youth. You're dealing with teenagers, and they are already going from, you know, kids to adults, and that in itself is a journey that is a challenge for them and, and their parents and their friends and their relatives and so on. So for you as a coach, you know, you're going to be uh, obviously exposed to that stuff as well or have been already, and, um, and it's just... Uh, part of the journey and part of the fun and you're going to need all of your skills to be able to bring the best out in the in these young people because part of what you can do uh, by the way you operate is help them become coachable you more than anybody else can help them become coachable and hopefully have them get to the point where they uh, recognize the importance of being coachable and then are able to work on that themselves of course, uh, part of uh, a teenager thing is social media and uh, millennials who, uh, you know, are, uh, are painted with a different brush. So if you haven't thought about, uh, you know, thinking about what that means, it's probably a good idea uh, as you're trying to understand when maybe they are being difficult for no reason, <coughs> excuse me, or maybe they're ignoring texts. Uh, and and other things that aren't to your liking as a high performance coach. All I would say is it's really important to be patient. And so I would uh, hope that you would uh, would find uh, the way to do that at the same time as you ramp up to uh, to help them become more coachable. That's for sure. And of course, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, you've had experience with coaching. Uh, junior men, junior women, uh, the coaching experience uh, can be different depending on who it is you're working with. And stereotypically, though, my experience has been that uh, that uh, junior boys uh, are happy to play together as long as they get a lot of W's and maybe uh, junior girls are more likely to not play as well as they might like to unless they're all getting along. As I say, a stereotypical remark which will vary from athlete to athlete, but that's just, uh, just uh, you know, my thinking uh, as I look back. Um, of course, one of the other things that's changed is modern families are, uh, are way different. Uh, so, you know, people are going to be getting, uh, going to be brought to you with different upbringings. So that in itself uh, all adds up to be a package that you might think is impossible at times, but the reality is, uh, uh, with you uh, uh, working hard at your at your trade here as a coach, and maybe getting some information out of uh, my presentation that is helpful, you may find that uh, you know what you can handle this, that you can embrace it, and that you enjoy it, and that's all good. So, what I'd like to really give you then is uh, five steps. Uh, to best ensuring your athletes become coachable. These are things that I really believe in are important for, uh, for youth coaches. And so uh, I'm going to uh, pass those on to you now and uh, give you my views in that regard. Number one, I think it's important for you to have an understanding of high performance curling. And although that on the surface might seem uh, you know, that I don't even need to ask that because you're involved in coaching. One of the challenges as I've gone across the country that I've noticed is that, you know, we have um, a lot of people who coach who are well-intended parents who maybe never have played at a highly competitive level. So it gives you extra challenge 
when you're trying to decide what it is that you can help them with. Uh, and, uh, and that's the beauty, of course, of being able to take uh, technical training and, uh, and, and coach training and so on. But nevertheless, um, we'll go through that, what those items of high performance are and what the keys are in each of those areas. Because the more I can help you understand them or reinforce in you what you think they already are, then the better chance you will have of doing a confident job with your athletes. Uh, I think it's important that you continue to grow as an effective leader because youth look for leadership. And although we don't all have uh, an amazing uh, array of leadership uh, capability. It can be learned, and uh, we can certainly uh, lead in in our own way, uh, many different ways of leading. But we can also call upon one of the great things that an effective leader does is he's not afraid to call on others to be part of his support team uh, and maybe uh, make a difference. And so you'll see that. Um, that there will be coaches who might call in a, uh, a strategy coach who might be a, uh, a player who is, uh, you know, still playing competitively but does have some time and is prepared to chart the course for the team from a strategy point of view. Or they might go to the local community college or university and get someone to come on board who might do nutrition work with the team uh, or, uh, or might be uh, – uh, have some uh, mental training and so on in their background. Lots of different ways of approaching a leadership role, but uh, hopefully uh, that's something that everybody, if they aren't embracing it already, is prepared to embrace. And I'll give you some tips on how you can do that. Uh, you need to plan for success. Now, I'm not talking, well, in a way I'm talking about, you know, the preseason planning where you might lay out the schedule, lay out the budget and so on. but um, you know, you need to spend some time in, in, in other areas of planning. And I'll get to that when we get to that section. And then I think one of the most important things that you would do is establish a strong team culture so that your athletes uh, are going to become even more coachable because they're going to enjoy being on that team. They're going to be prepared to listen to what everybody has to say and they're going to speak to each other and in, a, in, in a, a good manner and so on and so forth. So again, we'll get to that. And then the last one, which I have to put down here because if you want to have some success, you're going to have to work hard. Uh, you know, if you, and, and I, 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 I challenge you all and I urge you all to make the commitment to working hard because, uh, you know, you can really make a difference in these young people's lives because I think, you know, already uh but if you don't know already um uh, basically you know our one of our major roles is we're responsible to try and help out uh try try and turn out great canadians and uh we've been given this coaching opportunity as a way of doing that so yeah the the prizes and everything else uh and the success that goes with winning is very good but hopefully at the same time there's friendships earned confidence is built and people who go out and are when they become adults great canadians that serve our country well so when we talk about understanding high performance curling um you know just briefly i would go back and say well you know uh when we look at hockey versus coaching uh, there are two different cultures two different sports but hockey in a way um is very fortunate in that a lot of people in competitive players in hockey retire uh, at an early age and uh, they're back in their hometown playing beer league hockey baby and looking to want to give back. And so you'll get lots of highly competitive hockey teams that end up with former junior A hockey players, pros who didn't quite make it and so on, who know everything about strategy and everything about technical competence and uh, are prepared to learn the other skills. And because our sport of curling um, allows people to be competitive until they're just about 100 years old, it seems, a lot of people keep curling competitively and maybe don't make the commitment to coaching. And that's where we're so thankful 
that in many instances, we've got parents who step up and uh, are prepared to take over the coaching role when their kids are going through juniors, and then in some cases stay on thereafter. Now, again, I'm stereotyping the people that might be uh, in the room here with me, uh, but I'm sure there's others from other areas, people who just love coaching, who played competitively, and so on. But we need all of us working together to make it better for high-performance junior curling, that's for sure. So I thank you again for your commitment, and uh, and I say that. Uh, Hopefully we can help you uh, get better. We've talked about who you are uh, on that particular uh, section there. And uh, I guess one of the little words of advice that I might give you would be um, know what you know and know what you don't know. And I guess what I'm trying to say is don't BS your athletes. Um, just be prepared to say, you know what? I, I'm not sure about that, but I'll get back to you with advice from somebody else. And of course, the worst example would be if you were uh, if you were maybe calling a timeout and, and giving them advice on strategy when, in fact, um, you don't know enough about it to, to give it in a complicated situation. I really think what's more important is to try and be a problem solver at timeouts where you help the team solve their problem if you're not an expert in that area. If you are an expert, well, then that's great. You guys would have laid a plan out ahead of time and it would just be following through on that. But anyway, I'm so pleased that uh, you're coaching and uh, I look forward to meeting you live sometime. I know some of you based on the names and uh, look forward to that. So, okay, so this is not rocket science necessarily, but these are the components as I see them uh, of of high performance. So in other words, if you want to understand high performance, uh, as I've suggested, well then this is, these are, I think, the, the areas in which you can uh, summarize them. And, uh, and then if you look at each of those in a little bit of a detail, we can come up with a pre pretty good plan. And, and I can tell you that this team, this wonderful Rachel Holman team, embraces every one of these areas and i don't think there is any team out there that uh, is better in any of those areas than team Holman. they are truly uh, a high performance team extraordinaire who at the young age of in rachel's case i think she's still 27 maybe turned 28 she is a skip has now uh, become the youngest skip to win three scotties and the second youngest is Sandra Schmerler at 33. So you can see the opportunities that uh, are ahead for them. It's quite uh, exciting to say the least. So yeah, so there's are the areas then of, uh, of high performance uh, that make it up. And uh, the first one is, uh, is effective strategy. And um, so uh, what I was going to do um, was just... Uh, show a clip of an example of strategy, but I'll maybe uh, talk to a few things that are important first about strategy, just some, some key bullets that, again, if you understand these and are using them, then I think that it, it's another feather in your cap for your, your athletes who are, uh, are looking to be coachable, but maybe aren't quite there yet. And uh, first of all, the best strategy is the one that works. Um, and, and all teams, I think, should have a strategy for uh, how to start the game, and they should also have a strategy for the last three ends of the game. And then really, the way it works is, I don't think playing complete defense is the right way to go, or complete offense right, is the right way to go. Your job with the team is to figure out when to go on offense and uh, and when uh, to stay on defense. And for every team, that's going to be different. But certainly, I have a couple of points that come to mind. And one of them is that I would be more aggressive with the hammer, less aggressive without. And uh, I would add that, to me, patience is a virtue so that once you get down a couple of points early in the game, that's not the time to go high octane offense. That's the time 
to be patient and recognize that you might have to take 10 ends to win the game. So I have a number of one minute clips, but the per except for the first one. First one is a three minute clip, and uh, it's a highlight from the uh, final game uh, between uh, Rachel and Englot last year in the uh, in the uh, Scotties, the Canadian Championship. And uh, this is a demonstration of risk reward i.e. when to be patient, when not to be patient. In this particular case, it's the second end, and uh, Manitoba's winning one nothing, And the, the team's discussing whether to draw for one to tie it or to take the risk of, uh, of playing a really uh, uh, offensive shot for a bigger payoff. And, uh, and without going into too much detail, because we're only down by a point, I think it's a good risk. So let's listen to it. I think we don't have sound, Earl. Sorry. Okay. So Sorry. Right. Is, that a, is that a little better? There we go. Is that okay? No, we still don't hear it. So maybe you could walk us through it. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah. So the um, so the um, the the the, uh, the risk is that first of all, Rachel's lying second and third in the back, uh, eight foot, back 12 foot. And, um, and so she's looking at taking the risk of playing the in off of one on the side that might give them three. And if she doesn't make it, then, uh, you know, they're going to end up stealing, but they're only going to be down two nothing in the second end. And so that to me is a time when you might, might be prepared to take that risk. Uh, in order to get the reward, which is to, to make a shot for three. And um, so that's what they do. They talk through it. They look at all the pros and cons, and, um, and they decide that, uh, that that's what they're going to do, which is to take the risk. So it's always fun watching great shots. So we'll just have a quick look at this. As I say, this is the longest one I have. Wow, eh? What precision. Yeah, so there's just an example of, you know, think about risk reward because, uh, yeah, it's uh, it can be uh, a difference maker in being winning and losing. And if, you, if you're not patient and you're down a couple and your teams are playing aggressively, they may lose games that they normally wouldn't just because of all the risks that they're taking. Let's move on to talking about uh, the technical competence uh, side of stuff here. And, um, and so, you know, again, this is, um, this is fairly, um, I'll just touch on it. But um, to me, it's all about trying to throw it technically perfect as often as you can. But having athletes being aware of when they're sliding out, when they're not on the broom, and what adjustments they have to make. And then the third part of that would be for them to be aware for what the margin for error is on the shot. And if you do that, um, you make a ton of curling shots. And really, the only difference between the really uh, uber high performance players and your high performance players is that. The, the other higher performance players are technically perfect more often, but they still have to make the same kind of adjustments and the same, have the same thought processes that your teams have to have as well. So, you know, that's something to, uh, to bear in mind. 
So yeah, um, those are the three things. If you do that and you practice like crazy, then great things are gonna happen, that's for sure. Um, a couple of things that are really important uh, that I'd like to add on is, if you are not a team that has embraced throwing heavyweight accurately, that's something that you need to be doing because it is a difference maker. So make sure that you add that to your repertoire. And uh, I have an example uh, of somebody throwing heavyweight accurately, and it's Brett Gallant from Gushu's team. And I mean, basically, uh, what these guys are all shooting for is seven seconds, hog to hog. What that implies is if you throw it seven seconds or less, hog to hog, the rock runs really straight. So if you're peeling, you're always going to make the peel. If you're throwing a straight back and you have nice smooth release, uh, you're, you're going to have good results. The problem with people who don't maybe do the technique that's being shown here is that at the end of their delivery, in order to throw it heavy, they have to push the rock. And we all know that pushing it often results in it going offline. So I've got an example of Brett Gallant then throwing. I don't have uh, no opportunity to time it because I cut it off early, but you'll you'll see what it is that he does, and I'll I'll perhaps explain it as well. Whoops. Try that again. Little operator error. Sorry about that. Now I. So is the sound still uh, off on that one too? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just uh, we'll just have to uh, miss out on that. Uh, what I wanted to just show here, if I can move this in slow motion, in case you're not aware, but when high performance players are throwing this shot, the key for them is they. Uh, uh, I apologize. One last time here. Yeah, the key for them is to, uh, they, they lift their foot and hop when they come forward. Their foot comes right off the ice, and all the best players do that. And along with a deep park where they bring their foot way back, those are the two keys to, uh, to success on throwing heavyweight accurately. Okay, uh, mental toughness. Um, obviously an extremely important component. and. Uh, won't spend a, a whole bunch of time talking about it other than to say that uh, sometimes, especially at the junior level, we need to be aware of, of sort of other things from a mental toughness point of view that we may not think about a whole bunch that, but can throw juniors off, such as illness, some bad luck, bad rocks, bad ice, those kind of things. So you need to develop uh, a philosophy that allows you to uh, embrace those kinds of things happening into into in addition to the normal uh, components of uh, of mental toughness, that's for sure. Um, when I talk to high performance players and they talk about mental toughness, the one thing they are concerned about more than anything else is confidence. So certainly one of your important roles, whether you're bringing in a, a mental toughness coordinator to help out or not, uh, I still think all coaches should embrace. Uh, helping out on the mental toughness side. Certainly, keeping your athletes confidence is a difference maker. If they stay confident, then they're they're going to make way more shots than someone playing easier shots that isn't playing with confidence. So here's an example of uh, mental toughness, and uh, um, you won't. Uh, I'll just try this one, and if we if we're able to hear it, fine. And if we if we're not. Uh, uh, I'll just assume that we can't hear it the rest of the way, so I won't uh, expect it. But let's try it one last time for sound. And this is uh, Pat Simmons. And uh, this is the last rock to win uh, the Briar in Calgary uh, two years ago. And, uh, and the definition that I've always liked about mental toughness is just the one that's there on your screen. You know, the ability to perform at a very high level regardless of the circumstances. And this was very interesting because he was the home team and the place was packed and it's 
maybe somewhere in the range of $160,000 if they win and $40,000 if they come second, not in terms of cash necessarily, but invitations and so on and so forth. So when you, if you let yourself think about those kind of things, it can uh, it make it very difficult for you to make the shot. No, still no sound. Hmm. Sorry, Earl. Okay. If we're really quiet, we could hear it. Yeah, you know what? I think I'm going to just try speaking live, and um, and uh, and then maybe it might work a little bit better. I'll just make sure. Uh, yeah, I think it might work now. Just uh, tell me if you're going to get. It. Yeah, you got it. Got it. Yep. Okay, good. So uh, uh, maybe I'll. And it's a short one. I'll just maybe replay that one and then. Um, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds great. I'll I'll do that now. And I'll I'll um I think we'll be good the rest of the way. Okay, listen up, folks. You'll enjoy this, I think. Crowd settles down. Fight. The white. Draw for the win. Mine's good. Mine's good. Team Canada. Let's light. Let's light. Looks a little light, says Boris. Now it's up to Peason and Ryder. They need the white. They need the button. Here's Morris, too. They need the button to be the girl champion. Oh, winning is always so much fun, isn't it? Okay, so let's... Winning isn't everything, but losing sucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, just moving on then to solid um, team dynamics as maybe the uh, the next item on the list. And um, you know, if people, the bottom line is, if you get along as a team, then you can really concentrate more on getting your job done effectively. So it's such an advantage if you end up with with uh, with great team dynamics, that's for sure. And we'll talk about that just. Uh, a little bit more, but um, the um, you know, and, and, and the, the list of the things that make up team dynamics is is long as you want it to be because it all depends on different teams. But I'd want you to listen to this one, and some of you I'm sure have seen it already in either live, but but uh, it's the uh, the final from the Newfoundland uh, Briar, and it's the interchange. Between uh, Brett Gallant and uh, and Brad Gushu when he throws his last rock, and it's it's the level of trust that uh, you know is built up by this team that is really important to listen to here. Because man, first of all, to have the courage as a front end player, and you'll find lots of juniors won't have that courage to say to Brad what he says uh, as the final rock's about to be thrown is very praiseworthy. And then Brad was able to trust what he had to say, and, and then it resulted in good things happening. I think it's six feet slower than it's been all week in this past. Yeah. That much, eh? Yeah. Okay. About uh, wow. two through in the past. We can come to this, but I don't. I'm just saying. Yeah. You come out. Yes. It's been two feet slower. There you go. It's so already two feet slower now. So six feet. What game. does that mean, Russ? Oh. Well, it puts a doubt in Brad Gushy's head because six feet slower. You hate to throw it deep when you've got the pressures. Mark Nichols is going to come out because of the injury from Jeff Walker. Exactly. Well, if I try and throw it back eight normal, we're good. Yeah. Six feet is about a second. Brad, so if you've been throwing go. 15, it's about a 14. It's a little less. Quite Mark. a different feel. And there you good. go. You just see it start to yep. uh, creep up. As you take a look at Mark Nichols' wife, Colette. Yep, yeah, I like that. Nice. Yeah. Full in the eight. That's uh, what he needs. Smart. They figured out it was slower, though. It's been a spectacular 
Tim Horton's Dryer here in St. John's. He now has the chance to win his first Dryer title. Galant and Nichols. Galant and Nichols in the crowd. They need to get it. Cole Aid, and it's a big crowd now. It's getting frosty. Cole Aid is what you need. Cole Aid is what you need to become the Canadian Yeah, so um, just another example of, of, you know, part of the high performance package that uh, all added up gives you that competitive edge. Healthy lifestyles is the next one. And, and since we've been in the Olympics, you know, for the past, uh, say, 20 years, I think it is almost now, that's been, been such a high priority. And uh, just got a couple of clips to play in that regard um, uh, to share. You know, there's days where you wake up and, you know, it's a grind to get to practice or the gym or, you know, to approach the day with, you know, the attitude that you need. And I, I think about the way that they approach their training and, and I don't want to let them down. They lead by example. It helps motivate me to, to keep my head down and, and work hard. I grew up a huge fan of the sport. I fell in love with this game when I was, you know, seven or eight years old. So I think about how lucky and, and privileged I am to be in this position right now on such a great team. In the times where the season feels long or, or drained, um, you know, I try to think about, you know, how far we've all come and, you know, how lucky I am to be living this part of my life. So uh, you can see that, uh, you know, the top teams take that uh, very seriously, their, their fitness. Now, this is the last shot in the briar. And, and really why I like it uh, and relate it to high performance, the high performance package is this goes to show you the difference that fitness makes. Because if these two brushers uh, weren't as fit as they are, I'm not sure this rock gets there. And I don't. I'm not sure Kevin Cooey ends up representing us in the Olympics. Three, go. All that they can. A chance they may never get again. Final stone on the way. The real close. Okay. Like it. Not great numbers. Like better problem. Cooey. So at any rate, there's and, and then the last one I guess is team management. And uh, just to give you a sense for, uh, you know, I could just speak for the off-ice support that uh, Rachel had the last year I was with her, and I'm sure it's the same, if not better. But this is the level at which uh, the top teams uh, get support. Mental toughness managers, personal trainers, sponsorship manager, budget manager, travel coordinator, social media manager, nutrition consultant. I mean, those are, and those are all real people some of who are paid uh, to support them and some of who are not. But, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of people to build a champion. But you, at your level, there are people out there, uh, you know, certainly parents that would look after a budget or uh, might help out with sponsorship or travel coordination and so on, and universities or um, community colleges that might have people who would uh, be involved with your team from a nutrition or a mental toughness or a personal trainer's point of view. So, you know, opportunities are there, but uh, that's the high performance package. And you can see by the videos that I've shown you that they're, they're definitely difference makers. That's for sure. All right. So, so let's go on then to uh, talking about becoming an effective leader. And um, Earl. Yeah. I'm just wondering if this might be a good time to um, open up the mics and just see how 
uh, if there are any questions from anybody, is that, are you okay with that or would you like to do it at yeah, another point? That, that's fine. Yeah, I don't mind doing that. Okay, we're going to unmute everyone. Are there any questions so far for Earl? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody. There's a background noise and an echo. I'm not sure, but... I don't have a, I don't have even a, myself, I can hear my voice, voice. do I, do I, but, but. Yeah, if you're, if you're um, um, Rick makes Rick a good makes point. point, if you're not talking, then mute yourself. I can hardly make out what you're saying. I'm sorry, maybe, we, maybe it's okay, it was okay when Earl was talking, it's just when you switched to open mic for everybody. Okay, I'm going to turn the mics off then, and we'll go with questions via chat. Just too many people on tonight. Okay. Okay, Earl, you're still there? Yeah, I am. Okay, perfect. Okay, so if everybody would please, um, if you have any questions, send them via chat, um, and we'll... we'll uh, I'll I'll relay them to Earl and answer them as they come up, okay? And then we'll try again at the end of the call. Thank you. Okay, Earl. Okay. All right. So we'll keep moving here on to, um, you know, becoming an effective leader. And I just giving a shout out to Adam Kingsbury, who I have tremendous amount of respect for, who has uh, gone in in the last few years working with the girls and giving giving them what they really need right now, which is uh some some good help and support on uh say the mental toughness side uh team dynamics side and so on and he's very very good at that uh, i actually am also a, a mentor with him with another team so we get a fair amount of time together but he's just a great guy and uh i, I it looks good going forward for that team that's for sure um okay All right. Um, you know, so, I mean, if you're looking at leadership and I'm saying to you, this is a component of what you need to be, uh, that you need to take hold of the leadership role. And there's many different ways of doing that, but it's all about motivating these curlers to be coachable uh, and to get great results. I mean, it's uh, as simple as that. Uh, but the problem is there's a tendency to make mistakes along the way. And I've made lots of mistakes as well and probably said things that didn't resonate with everybody as you can see by the expression on Rachel's face <laughs> but uh, nevertheless uh, you know you always do the best you can and you're not always going to be right and uh, and that's just the way it is so all right so um so let's take a look at let's think about for a second what are the mistakes that uh, that people tend to make as coaches and uh, and here they are Okay, first of all, we tend to give them too much information. Um, and I'm speaking generically in sport, not specific for curling necessarily, but I'm just letting you know that that's the way uh, the information, that's what the information out there is saying in North America. Uh, and people lose their temper. And coaches have negative attitudes. And there's a complete focus on winning, and in some cases, a complete lack of not knowing how to make it fun. And I can tell you that without a doubt, if you don't know this already, it needs to be fun first. All kids that are curling are not doing this uh, for a living. They're doing it because they've chosen this sport, and, and part of your responsibility as a leader is to make sure that it is fun and and that you turn around the other things that are on there if if this is a message that's speaking to you but there are all sorts of ways to become an effective leader and here are some of the attributes that you might expect from a leader okay someone in a coaching role you know uh, that you you um 
work to be a skillful communicator, that you display confidence in the way that you operate, and that you show fairness. And this is sometimes a challenge for coaches who are coaching their own kids, or sometimes it's perceived as a challenge because, you know, it's a pretty tough position that you put yourself in. Uh, I'm a great believer in that athletes, youth should be exposed to more than one coach so that they can see different coaching styles. So even if you are a parent who dearly wants to coach their kids all the way through, sometimes it's a good idea to let others in there, maybe take on a support role or take a year off or whatever. Generous with your time. Generous with um, your expertise uh, and so on. Really important. That you're honest uh, with your team in terms of your thoughts. Uh, that there is humility in who that you are. So it's not about you. Uh, it's about the kids and the kids having fun, the kids being successful and, and so on. They're the ones in the spotlight. And you really do them a good service as a leader if you continue to seek mastery of your role as a coach. Um, you know, and, and even something like charisma is something over time, if you've worked on all of your attributes, can be good. Optimism, or, or can be not easy for everybody, but can, can take place. You're, you, you give freely of your time through selflessness, and you're trustworthy. When you say the practice is at two o'clock and they all show up at quarter to two to warm up, you don't show up at quarter after two sort of thing. That, that grows stale in a hurry. And that you're a man of character who they can, uh, when he says something, they can depend on it. You're consistent in your approach. You're a great listener and so on. You can actually do uh, a self-evaluation in these areas. And I would encourage you to do it because we won't have enough time for it tonight. Where you look at all of those skills, uh, those attributes, you list them. And then you do a little bit of a reflection on yourself. And and maybe if you if you rated yourself either a one, two, or three, one being outstanding one being good and uh and uh two being good sorry three being fair or uh something like that and then look at the couple that are maybe below the ones and twos and and then lay out a, an action plan and what you might do to get better in those areas um then we talked about hockey versus curling coaches already and uh so you know as i say the number Two role here after learning everything about high performance is to try and become a really effective leader. And then you really need to plan for success. And um, planning for success, to me, um, yes, you, you know the budgets and the, the scheduling and uh, the, the uh, practices and so on and so forth, but some other things. If you get the opportunity, you should probably hold a team meeting before you agree to coach to make sure it is a good fit. Uh, maybe it's not, in which case uh, they would be better off with somebody else uh, or and you'd be better off with somebody else. Or maybe you can talk about, well, you know what, I was thinking this and maybe uh, you can get them to agree to change or they may get you to agree to change. But nevertheless, I think that's important. It's great if you have the opportunity the previous year to try out the team before you buy in because, you know, it, it may not necessarily be a really good fit sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that I feel strongly about <coughs> is if you get a chance, you should try the team to see how they play. And I wouldn't be in a hurry to have everybody set in their particular positions even though they might think that that's the way it should work. I think there's more, to, there's more to be gained from saying, well, let's wait until we've tried this combination together, especially if it's a new one. Let me give you an example. Uh, John was runner up in Canadian juniors in 1997 and in 1998, he lost his front end. So he had Craig Saville and himself and Brent Lang, the guy we just saw a picture of and the guy named Andy Ormsby said, hey, we'd like to join their team. They're the second best team in Ontario. So I had the luxury, it was in March, of finding a bond spiel. I said, oh, let's go, on, let's go and try something. We went to a, 
men's skins games field. Uh, they lived six hours from us, the two of them, and, and Craig and John lived close together. Uh, and I knew that Brent was wanted to play lead, and I knew that John, they wanted John to skip, but I knew both Andy and Craig wanted to play third. So I said to them, okay, uh, how do you want to do this? And sure enough, they both verbalized, want to play third. So I said, well, look, why don't we alternate for these six games? So we did. We won all six. It was a men's thing. We won 2000 bucks. I went upstairs with him afterwards and said, said, what do we got? And Andy said, I'm happy to be the second on this team. So that was the end of any problems we had. We went out and won the world juniors and then repeated the year after. So, uh, but I could have imposed it. You know, there was a logic that might have said, look, these guys are runner up last year. Let Craig play third. So I just tell this story because I see countless situations where coaches play God. And to me, it's a mistake to, to, uh, to make up in your, in your own mind ahead of time uh, if there are some athletes that don't agree with that. Uh, and then you end up with people who are unhappy. And ultimately, I've seen in four or five occasions over the last couple of years, kids have quit curling <coughs> because they never got the opportunity to play a position they liked. So let them, let them, uh, help them figure it out. Let them help you figure it out. Don't uh, impose, please. Um, I have, uh, I've used written contracts as a way of spelling out exactly how we're going to operate in the various areas of our core values. Uh, I think it's important to hold a preseason parents meeting because invariably parents are, are in, in many instances, are going to cause you some problems. The best thing you can do at the start of the year is to remind them that you are really counting on them to be cheerleaders and to help you out in some capacity um, with fundraising or managing or whatever. But uh, but um, do that if you if you can. If you've never done it before, do it next time around. It takes away a lot of problems. It makes it a lot easier when you've said to be a cheerleader and a parent now is off in the corner telling their kids this, that they should be doing this or that, that you can walk over and say, remember we had that meeting at the start of the year? And it uh, makes it way easier for you to, to keep your stress level down and so on. So uh, anyway, just some thoughts. And continue to work at getting better. Uh, and this is an area where you should look at settling on a good debrief, a good fifth end break, what to do in timeouts and post-game formats. You need to think about this. And, and the bottom line is, think of yourself as not being a know-it-all. Think of yourself as being a problem solver or a facilitator to help them move on. Um, I often say to people, geez, if it's the fifth end break and the score is tied, uh, a monkey can go out there and say the right things. Uh, you know, score is tied, they got the hammer and so on. Um, take the the fruit out and uh, and and uh, you know give a raw raw kind of uh, uh, expression or two, but you earn your money when it's the fifth end and they're down two and they don't have the hammer and you want to find a way to win that game. The best thing to do is to have a meeting with the team that says, "What do you want from me? To, what do you want me to say in the fifth end break when you're down two?" You don't have the hammer that's going to help you win the game. They'll tell you. And if they just shrug their shoulders and they don't tell you because they don't know, then that gives you an opportunity to pick four or five things you might say. Well, what about if uh, I talk about, you know, um, the rocks and ice a little bit and I rock, talk about the importance of not being quiet because we've gone quiet. And what if I talk about uh, the fact that we're a good second half team and so on, you know, that to me is is the way you want to handle it. You don't want to be uh, a dictator. You want to be collaborative with them. That's for sure. And then of I'm course, sorry. yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We have a question. Yeah. Um, what does a good debrief look like? Well, um, a good debrief. Um, its purpose is to park the game we've just played and to move on to um, to getting ready for the next game. So those are two pieces that need to be in there. Uh, there should be praise for what you've seen in the first half, in my view. Um, uh, and, and, and often what I've done with teams is I have them do something called the ladder drill, where I ask them, 
for the, I say either go up the ladder or down the ladder. If I go up the ladder, the lead talks about, this is opening the debrief. The lead talks about the second and the great things that, that the second did in the game or something they did great. Second talks about third, third talks about skip, skip talks about the lead. That puts everybody in a good frame of mind. So it, it makes the climate better and I think that that is, is a, a good, good way to operate. Then I would uh, say that um, uh, after you've done that, you could look at talking about uh, a little bit about what's happened and, um, and, and maybe talking about, you know, the most challenging end that we had, get that out of the way, and then sort of be forward thinking and say, okay, what do we have to do differently in the second half that's going to, uh, sorry, we're talking about the debrief. I, I apologize. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the big thing is to be able to let it go and then move on to the next game. And you can do it anywhere. You can do it in the, in the rink. You can do it in the hotel. You can do it in the restaurant. You can do it in your vehicle. Or you can not do it. If someone just won by a whole bunch, not doing it often is a good idea because, you know, you, don't have, you just restate the obvious. Or if you've lost by a whole bunch and it's out of character for you, sometimes the best thing to do with that is just park it and move on. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's uh, some thoughts. So there are several different, different kinds of kind of format formats. Format. Yeah, and, and I mean, I've got some, I don't have uh, anything on this presentation, but if there's a coach that wants me to send them something for the kind of components that we're talking about here, um, I think it's always important to not do individual critique in front of everybody else. I've never had any success with that, and I just find that it is stressful for athletes. I'd much rather talk in a global sense about what didn't go well from a team's point of view or what went really well. Uh, and sometimes we forget to talk about the things that went really well. But if you're gonna critique somebody, it's often better separately by texting, hey, looks like you had a tough time out there. Is everything okay? I've often had good results with that kind of dialogue. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Um, and again, I talked about forming teams and mid-season changes. Oh, man, I've got some horrible stories about coaches who thought, you know what, Skip's not playing well, we're going to demote them, put the third up, and uh, oh, God, it never ends well. I believe that once you've made the commitment to play a certain way, unless the player steps forward and says, you know what, I'm not enjoying this, or you know what, I'm not making the shots, why don't we try something else, I'm okay with that. All right, so let's talk about culture. And um, we have about we have a left, Earl. Okay. All right, so I, I'll I'll uh, I'll skim over this fairly quickly, and um, and basically what we're talking about here is I think it's important for us to uh, to have values uh, in three different areas, and I'll just go quickly here. Um, So good culture, bad culture. We're looking for good behavior, good thinking, and good feelings. And I think if you have those kind of discussions at the start of the year about how we uh, are going to um, uh, talk, and sorry, what actions we're going to be like, we're going to be kind, we're going to be encouraging, we're going to be supportive, we're not going to be critical, stubborn, angry. We're not. That's not going to be part of our DNA as a team. Um, Thinking wise, we're going to be positive, we're going to be curious, we're going to be joyful, uh, we're not going to have negative humor, uh, we're not going to be non-caring, uh, we're not going to be passive aggressive in our approach. So, um, and then the third one is feelings, and that is confident, trusting, included, uh, inclusive feelings I think are good, and lacking confidence, suspicious, ex feeling excluded are not so good. So those are things that for you to look at and and figure out a way you're going to introduce them to your team but uh, they are of value uh big value because again if you do that before the season starts it puts you in a good position to be able to uh intervene if things aren't going on remember we we talked about not getting angry remember we talked about uh being inclusive 
et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it allows you to keep the ship on course uh, a lot better, that's for sure. And of course, if teams feel good about themselves, then their chance of success is, uh, is really significant. So yeah, if you're great in all those areas, uh, good things happen. Um, so maybe as the last part of this, I could talk to this if there is interest, if it, they haven't felt, uh, or maybe I'll just speak to it uh, and, um, and say, uh, as far as taking feedback is concerned, uh, I, I think that the door should always be open to your athletes. I think though, as far as parent, parental feedback is concerned, everybody has to develop their own way of doing that. Sometimes one person as a spokesman for parents is good. That's not a bad idea. Um, as far as handling criticism, I always do it individually or recommend that you don't do it collectively in front of everybody. Um, I think you need to be open-minded uh, as a coach and as an athlete. Uh, and and uh, by that, I mean adaptable to change strategies, things like that. And 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 athletes need to realize they're not going to be perfect and should accept the fact that they're going to make it. Um, any rate, bottom line is here, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And certainly I would add on here that it doesn't include country of ours anymore. And uh, if you surround yourself with great people and you work hard, uh, good times ahead. And just pass over a bit of this humor and rem remind you that it's important to have fun. And the last thing I would say is the champions come from everywhere. So wherever you are coaching, there's no reason if you're interested in being a champion and having teams that are champions that you can't be successful. There's lots of opportunity everywhere. There's just different ways sometimes that you have to do it. And so I'm pretty much done. Um, and if there are some questions, I'd be happy to answer them if the system is working. And if not, um, I'll leave it up to you, uh, my uh, great administrator, to tell, tell uh, to go from there. Okay, I'm going to reclaim the presenter role, although I'm not echoing now. There was a question, Earl, um, about what are the key points to include in a contract. Uh, is that something that you could answer? Um, privately? No, privately would be good, but maybe yeah. in a quick notes version and real, real quickly, or would you prefer to communicate that um, with the person who was asking the question? Uh, no, I'm happy to just talk about it in the calls notes version, and that is basically you should. You know, the beauty of a contract is you can put what your culture is going to be like in there, what your beliefs, your attitudes, the way you think and feel are going to be. You could even put in there what the strategy is going to be for the team, how we are going to operate on and off the ice, and what we embrace as as our high performance uh, goals. So. Not a whole, whole bunch needs to be in there, but it's going to be different for every team. But anything that you can do before the season starts from a planning point of view or from an organization point of view is going to save you so much negative energy during the season. It's, uh, it's just uh, the way to operate. Absolutely. Include process goals, um, how you're going to achieve your performance goals, how many practices. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Physical absolutely. training, you know, that can be in there too. Of course, and I think that those are great suggestions. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I'm uh, I'm going to thank you first, um, so that we don't have a lot of echo and feedback, etc. But then I will open up the mic um, to every. I'll unmute everybody else, and so we'll see if there are any last minute comments. First of all, Jim um, made a comment in the chat box about great examples, Earl. You did a. Um, you know, spot on 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 providing the examples that um, really drove home the points you were making. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for the informative session and for also acknowledging the work that coaches do. It, it's never expressed enough because as coaches, it's certainly not about money. <laughs> and it's certainly 
really isn't about being thanked, but it's about um, being able to share um, a passion and an experience with a group of like-minded individuals and watch them um, develop into strong, um, capable, confident, and um, high-performance athletes. Well um, your advice about bringing in experts, I think, is extremely important because we can't be coaches that can cover all areas when you get to that high performance and that emergent high performance level. So there's nothing wrong with bringing in, you know, Renee, Renee Sonnenberg or Jeff Stoughton or Mark Nichols or, you know, reaching out even, as you said, to, to your local community college to bring in um, a mental performance um, higher level student. So uh, very well, um, very well put. So I'll open up the mic and just see if we have anybody that would like to say anything. Okay, are there any questions? Rick Collins says, thanks for always giving your best to coaches, Earl. <laughs> Thank you. Do we, do we uh, have, have Earl's, Earl's email address so that we could ask maybe a short question sometime in the future? It was I'm on the. Terrible, I'm getting a terrible feedback here. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna mute you just for a second. Earl's uh, email address was on the meeting invitation, but when I send out the recording of this session, I'll. Uh, copy Earl on it as well, so you you have it and you will have it again. Okay, I just that uh, oh oh there is an echo. It's just that I'm uh, I'm a very much an uh, older person, but a coach with a junior team who I just fired myself from about ten days ago because I believed they weren't coachable, and I have. Um, Questions at a different level, I guess, than the high performance ones. Um, and I really don't know if I can ask this question because the uh, feedback is really bad. So maybe I'll just type a little short question. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Always happy to talk to other coaches and uh, dialogue can, on coaches. Can we, uh, moderate, administrator, can you, can you take us off mute? Uh, off. So, Earl, you were saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I have no problem uh, staying in touch with people. Uh, and and I've, I've found that usually it's a, a question or two here or there as opposed to somebody. I've run into a couple of people who are relentless, but you just say, look, I, uh, I've only got so much time. I, I We're going to have to cut it, uh, cut it off there. So I don't mind anybody that's listening to this that uh, has uh, other uh, questions or concerns. Uh, happy to help out. Was that Anne from Charlottetown? Is that who that was that was talking? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was. Okay. I think I've met her at another uh, coaches conference. And boy, they need, uh, they need, we, we need help in many places, but PI needs help. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much, Earl, again. And um, everybody that's still on board, you will be receiving the, um, the recording. Um, if, if, and I'll talk to Earl about the slide deck, um, Earl, you and I can talk about that later on, um, uh, about whether the slide deck can be shared or not, but, but we'll have that conversation. Right. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Earl. And, uh, stay tuned. We have some more, uh, webinars coming up in January, one on, um, uh, team dynamics from Nicole Stewart at Nicole Stewart. No, Nicole Westland Stewart, um, and there are uh, a few other good good presentations in the works. And who knows, we might be able to convince Earl to come back and do another one for us. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thanks everybody, and good night. Thanks everybody. Good night. <laughs>